<laughs> Finally, I actually left my tomato plants out overnight for a change. Although I could have a couple nights ago, I just want to be careful because they're at that stage where, you know, it's just over the top. Now they're going to pretty soon start blooming and giving off tomatoes and just yum. <laughs> so I don't want to ruin it. But in life, as we live in these last days, things are getting tougher. I don't know if you noticed it, but in Christendom, there's a, a big move right now to kind of redo or change or reevaluate the basics, you know, going back to the basics, you know, whether it be in kind of this Christian political scene where they're always going back to our founding fathers and making up all kinds of stories about them, or whether it be in Christianity teaching where you see a lot of ministries going back to the basics or getting back to, you know, Discipleship 101 or starting to talk about, you know, the, the normal stuff that people used to take for granted that everybody knew until they started watching television and started seeing specials on people being asked questions and they hadn't a clue what they're talking about. It's kind of like when people are saying like the president's a Muslim because they don't know what Islam is or they're saying that, you know, uh, Mormons are Christians because they don't know what Christianity is or they don't know what Mormons are. I mean, it's kind of a, a mixed bag of all kinds of people shooting off their ideas when they don't know what they're talking about. So you see in these latter days, there's a lot of lack of knowledge when we have more information out there than we've ever had before. There's a wealth of information, but there's no wisdom to know how to disseminate it or how to learn what's important and ignore what's not. Because you see, the television generation grew up with this bombardment mentality that we just plop in front of the TV and get bombarded. And whatever sticks, sticks. Whatever catches our eye, whatever provokes us, invokes us, traps us, hooks us, grabs us by the gonads, grabs us by the collar, whatever really can take us out of our doldrums, we pay attention to. You know, either soap opera so we get romantically inclined or maybe uh, news stories that say, oh, wow, you know, and gets all excitable, you know, but it's hype after hype after hype story. So after a while, you just kind of, you kind of go, uh, you know, it's just gotten old, you know, and you flip it off. Or your new season lineup, you know, or your reality television. Now we know that's not reality, but people want to believe that it is. So you see, there's this bombardment idea of just bombard the people until they pay attention. It doesn't work. It becomes a hardening process where no longer are you sensitive to what the Spirit is saying, but you're rather being desensitized to what God is saying. You don't look for Jesus in your day, you know, to speak to you in a personal way. You're not watching for those little signs along the way that let you know that He's with you or that He's going to comfort you just around the corner or that something yet needs to be done in your life not in someone else's. And that being the case, in these latter days, we need to really pay attention to what we do know and what we shouldn't be involved in. Because there's a wealth of things you could do with your life. You know, you could, you could be a politician. You could be a football star. You could be, oh, I don't know, the latest, greatest craze, you know. Kind of like what happened with Tim Tebow, you know. I mean, it was, it was nice to see how people galvanized themselves and got excited for a short period of time. Because in the long term, what Tim Tebow does in his personal life is more important than what he did in his professional life. You see, his professional life is what he does as a hobby. His real life is about what he does with his faith. And that's the way it should be with you. Your job should not be, literally, your faithful life or the life that God has given you to give back to him as a demonstration of who you are. Rather, your job should just be providing you some income to pay your bills, you know, and to take care of some things that you could use in the ministry. Because the ministry is your life. That's what you were called to do. You were called to be a witness wherever you are, however you are, whatever you're doing, everywhere you are. And that's what people forget nowadays because they want to point out and do other things except for talk about Jesus. You see, 
Jesus gave us standards that he set so high that no one could attain to them. Like love your enemy. No one can attain to that. No one is doing it. As a matter of fact, most of Christianity is against it today. They are teaching that you can hate the Muslim because he's the practitioner of Islam and he's deceived, or that you could hate the Mormon because he's a practitioner of the Mormon theology and not love them. You know, that you can love them, but you know, you don't really love them because you're not going to get involved in their life, you're not going to talk to them, you're not going to relate to them, and anybody that does is a false teacher. They're part of this weird idealism that you've got about humanism or Christism or some weird stupid idea that came along that you got wrapped up with and you found out that, hey, those are people that are trying to say, don't love your enemies. They're trying to say, don't witness the gospel, don't share Jesus. So you see, there's a problem here in these latter days. There's a spirit of Antichrist out there that wants you to not be like Jesus. Because if you're like Jesus, then you're not out shooting people. You're not out killing people. You're not out stomping on them. You're not out arguing with them. You're not out debating with them. You're out sharing Jesus. Because Jesus shared his Father. He said, I came not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Today, are you doing God's will? Literally. Do you know what God's will is, and then are you doing it? In other words, are you revealing Jesus in your everyday life? Do you fight with your neighbor? Do you argue with the man down the street? Are you more into football? Are you more into politics? Are you more into your fantasy league? Are you more into your man cave? In other words, what are you doing with your life? You've got such a short time left, and the world is being misled into a complete opposite direction of what Jesus said to do to watch and be ready. And there's a reason why. Because the clock is ticking and it's winding down and it's going to stop. And when it stops, you're on the other side. So you see, in these latter days, we need to pay attention to what we're doing with our time. We have so little time left that we need to wind it down to meet God every day. We need to wind up, so to speak, to point the way of where we should go. We don't want to be caught with no time left. Because that's what Jesus said. Watch and be ready, for you know not the day or the hour that the Son of Man might return. Likewise, you don't even know what day you could die. You could drop dead today. Most of us are getting a little older. You know, we're not so we're not so healthy anymore. You know, we're not the ticker's not running like quite tick tock tick tock like he used to. It's going tick uh, tock uh, tick uh, tock. Oh, whew, close call. But you see, that's what the point is. What you do is important to fulfill that which God made you to be. If you're not fulfilling His purpose, you're not accomplishing His will. God purposed you to be His witness. That's the number one thing in your life. There should be no doubt about what God's will is in your life. And that is to be His son or daughter. And you need to grow up in that. That's why you have a church. That's why you have a religion. That's why religion isn't bad. It's meant to grow you up. It's meant to teach you, to train you, and then to send you out into the world. To be able to deal with all these distractions. To be able to look at political systems and political means and say, well, that's nice, but I'll pray. And whatever God tells me to do, that I'll do. But if he didn't tell me, you know, like to do that, I'm not doing it because I don't want to waste my time. Or, you know, when people are fighting and arguing and bickering, do you really want to do that or do you just walk away and pray for them? Or say, hey, like I used to, walk right in the middle of an argument and say, let's pray right now. You know, all of us, let's pray. No, wait, no, 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 you don't need to add anything. Let's pray right now. Let's pray. No, 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 you don't have to say anything. Just let's pray. Let's pray. Now, they may pray some pretty weird prayers because they're arguing and fighting and everything, but when you start in prayer, you leave it there. And the nice thing about that is that once you've taken it to the Lord in prayer, you've left it there so that He can do what He wants to do. You don't have to worry about it. You walk away without even thinking about it. Because these are the days that you were chosen for to live in this time, this generation. You were born for such a time as this. So you need to recognize that this is different. You're running out of time. You're running out of space. 
You're running away from what God chose you to do. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. The end of all things is at hand. People try to tell me the end of the world is this year. And I say, no, it's not. Or that the rapture is this year, 2012. Or that's going to happen in 2012. I say, no, it's not. And I tell them straight out, no, flat out, no. Because it's all been predicted to be that way with the Mayan things and all these other Nostradamus things and all these things where people would get wrapped up into it and make a false prediction and then quit believing in Jesus' return. Now, I know from December 31st, midnight onward, you better recognize that so much garbage is going to come at you. You are not going to be ready. The world is going to be deceived in a lot of ways, and then Christians are going to get caught up into it in other ways, and that so much is going to happen so fast that it will whip by like a time machine, and you won't know when the Lord returns, because he could return any time from pardon me, 2012, December 31st, stroke of midnight onward, so to speak. I'd say sundown, but you know, we're not going to go Jewish on you. <laughs> From Jerusalem. So, the point is, is that I know, based upon all that I've seen in prophecy and all that I've known, you know, in relationship with the Lord, that these things are escalating. They're getting quicker and quicker and quicker. People are getting more and more deceived faster and faster and faster. They're getting caught up into other things quicker and quicker and quicker with absolutely no backup plan, no way out. They are gone way down the road. I saw a man the other day that was had a dynamic Facebook page, a wonderful witness, and then all of a sudden you know, he started on an Obama trade and he went all the way the rest of his day hating on the president. And it completely witnessed that he's not a Christian because... His material, while it started off as being about Jesus, went back into the world and his ways. That's a carnal Christian. That's fleshy. Do you really think God wants to take your flesh to heaven? Or does he want to take your spirit? Good question. Watch and be ready. Because that's what Jesus said. He didn't say, you just watch because everybody's going. He said, watch because not everybody's going. That's the point. You need to prepare yourself. Be sober and be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. What you see is what you get. What you have seen is Jesus, and you have seen how God has delivered you from darkness into the light. You have walked in the light as he is in the light. You have been a Christian. You have been in the fellowship of the godly. But you've gone in a different direction because you got caught up in the world. And so you're seeing things differently. You're seeing things that you think you need to criticize. You're seeing things that you think you need to challenge. You're seeing things that you think you need to warn people about. You're seeing things that God never told you to do because you didn't look to see Jesus in it. If you don't see Jesus in it, don't do it. That's the point. There is never, never some theology out there that is accurate if you can't see Jesus in it. It is always wrong. Everything that Jesus did said he reveals the Father. He said, he, so much so that he said that, that even his disciples came up to him and said, well, if you just show us the Father, then we understand. He says, look, if you see me, you've seen the Father. That's the point. Your life is meant to be that revelation of God, literally. You're working on that revelation of God in you, not in someone else, not discipling them or teaching them or making yourself out to be something you're not, but to take the time, to make the time to be with God so that as you're in that company with God, fellowshipping, He changes you. You become more likened unto Him, more loving, more forgiving, more merciful more grace giving, more merciful in the sense of giving that to others that they don't deserve. You become charity personified, as the old expression used to say. So as you become like Jesus, then 
you enjoy that and you want to spend more time with him. Because if you're spending less time with Jesus and more time in ministry, you're missing the point. The more you spend with Jesus, he will direct you. The less you spend with Jesus, the more you're self-directed. You want to be less of yourself and more of him. If you don't, you will fail. You will be misled and you will be completely deceived. And I don't care who you are. You'll get caught up into what you think you should do. The just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. For we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. What you're watching for isn't the second coming and signs of the times. You're watching for Jesus. That's the point. Your eyes, if they be full of light, how great is the light within. But if your eyes be full of darkness, how great is the darkness therein. People that are into prophecy lately are looking at negative things. They're looking at darkness. They're not looking at signs of times. They're just promoting false ideas because they're caught up into the hype and hyperbole rather than the person of Jesus. They don't say in their prophecies, watch for Jesus, do they? Watch it and see. Ask me, or ask me, go look and see. Go look and see at the end, you know. They might add a byline once in a while to say, watch and be ready for you know not the day or the hour. But other than that, what part of their prophecies, you know, when they're talking about this war or that war or that coming down and this is happening and this is, oh, we got to do this and get ready for, you know, like surviving the tribulation? I don't think so. But, you know, when they're doing all this stuff, when do they mention Jesus? That should warn you immediately of what you're missing from them and what they're missing in their theology. Jesus. The point is, is Jesus knew the temple was going to be destroyed. He warned everyone. He says, look, temple, this, this temple will be cast down. You know, no stone left unturned. It's going to be wiped out. And that was it. He dropped it. They didn't bring it up, you know, like, oh, well, you know, okay, fine, that's going to happen now. Let's get into what are all the signs that are going to happen. Went through it briefly and then went on with, you do what I'm telling you to do. Wait in Jerusalem for the imbuing of the Holy Spirit to come upon you, that you would have power to be my witnesses unto Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So you need to, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, first of all, you need to get the Holy Spirit inside you. But the point is, is that doing what Jesus says to do is the person you're supposed to be seeking to follow. The church trains you into how to hear him, how to understand him, how to know him, how to follow him, and no one else. If you're following a church teaching or a doctrine, then you're religious without relationship. You have to balance the two. The relationship should be in religion that it guides you into the place of knowing Jesus in a personal way. And he will lead you in the way. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us that. It exhorts us that he would direct us. It gives us a confidence in the day of salvation. Otherwise, you're putting your confidence in men. Fear thou not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen you. Yea, I will help you. Yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. I, thy God, will hold thy right hand. What do you think we need to do? Take my hand, dear Lord. Walk with me this day. In my heart I know. I will never stray. You're done. Put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. These people weren't talking about a figurative, nominal faith. They were talking about a real reality that though they didn't maybe perhaps know it, they knew what had been said about it. And that's what we are called to do. Walk with God today. Don't walk away. Don't think you've got it, because as he said in the beginning, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Don't get caught up, distracted, by letting the weeds grow up into your plant life, into your personal life. The weeds are the world. How much of the world is involved in your faith life? How much of the world is involved in your spiritual life? And how much is Jesus involved in any of your life? Because if he's not all of your life. Jesus said that I'm none of your life. That's pretty sobering.
pretty serious and maybe something you want to talk to jesus today